Hey everybody, Milton Davis here. It's uh, August 31st, the last day of the month, and also the last day of the Sword and Soul Month celebration. Um, I hope you everybody has have has enjoyed the uh, videos that we've been doing this month discussing Sword and Soul. I hope you have also taken the time to visit our website um, and take advantage of some of the uh, discounts that we've had on all our Sword and Soul books. I've decided to end this month the way I started it. Um, discussing the founder of Sword and Soul, um, Charles Saunders. Um, not too long after I met Charles, uh, we started working together on a number of projects. Um, we did the um, Griot's Anthology. Take that down right here. We did Griot's Anthology. And we also did Griot's Sisters of the Spear. During that time, Charles sent me a short story that he had written years ago and uh, for me to take a look at. And it was called uh, The Return of Sundiata. And it was a short story that I really enjoyed. This was something that was written in the world of Nuyambani, but did not include Imaro. Um, so later on, we started talking and he said he had a collection of short stories that he had published over the years. And he really would like to compile them and put them into a uh, story, short story collection. So I said, hey, Charles, that's a great idea. I'd love to work with you on that. And that's what we basically did. Um, so we got all the stories together and I commissioned an artist by the name of Edison Moody to do the cover art. And I worked with Edison before he did the cover art to the city and did a very did a very good job on that. Um, so we wanted to base the cover art around the story, The Return of Sundiata, which we did. And um, this is the cover of the book. As you can see, um, Edison did an amazing job on the artwork. So to wrap up everything with the Sword and Soul month, I decided to read the story, The Return of Sundiata. Um, again, thank you guys for supporting us this month. Thank you for um, checking out the videos, uh, for taking advantage of these uh, discount sales. And um, let's end it all with a reading of The Return of Sundiata. I'll start off by reading the intro that Charles wrote for the story. The name Sundiata resonates through the history of, of the Africa we know. He was the first monarch of Mali, which was the greatest African kingdom of the Middle Ages. Reigning from 1230 to 1255 AD, he, expand, he expanded Mali's agriculture and gained control over the trade of salt and gold. This trade formed the basis of the kingdom's ascendance. In Nuyambani, there's a different Sundiata, whose story is heroic in its own right. My interpretation of the African icon Sundiata first appeared in a magazine called Cascade in 1982. Sobbing softly, Kiemba stumbled unsteadily along the narrow hill trail. In the muted glow of the moon, tears streamed in silver tracks down her ebony cheeks. Behind her, a line of crimson blotches marked her progress up the steep stony path. With which each step Kimba took, more blood trickled down her thighs. Her clothing was torn, her half-naked body throbbed with pain, and her soul was seared with humiliation and despair. Still, she continued to struggle upward. She knew what waited, waited, awaited her if she stopped or retraced her, or traced her way back down the hill. Ahead of her lay a dream. Despite the sobs shaking her slight frame, Kiemba was buoyed by that dream. She refused to consider the possibility that she had suffered greatly for a mirage. The one she sought must, must abide at the summit of the harsh craggy hill. He must. Suddenly, Kiemba stopped. Standing motionless as a, as a carving, she listened. Yes, she could hear it again. A distant suggestion of sound, a clink of metal against metal, a scuff of leather against stone. Kimba looked down the trail and saw several dark, indistinct shapes in the distance. Panic seized her. She began to run desperately, terror rushing through her sick in sick waves. So soon had the sow discovered what she had done. Now they pursued her, easily following her crimson spore. In that single glimpse downward, Kimba had realized that the sow would not hurry in. How long, they undoubtedly thought, could a bleeding young woman remain ahead of them? Longer than you think, Kimba vowed fiercely. She was, her determination was as hard as steel. 
but the outrages she had endured early in the day were beginning to exact their toll. The wings fear had lent to her feet vanished. Her footsteps faltered and her knees began to buckle. She knew she would collapse soon. She would lie exhausted on the trail, helpless when the sow finally came for her. She tripped and sprawled painfully on a broken stone. The sound behind her grew louder. Kimba forced herself to her feet and gazed wide at the yawning mouth of the cave that marked the termination of the trail. Despite the fatigue creeping through her limbs, a flame of gratification kindled in her heart. She had been right. The legend sung by generations of griots is true. She had found the cavern of Sundiata, the god who was a man, and Sundiata would be there. Without hesitation, Kimba made her way into the beckoning blackness of the cave. Squealing, leather, back, leather winged bats brushed past her face. She paid them no heed. Her attention was claimed by a splash of golden luminescence deep within the cavern's interior. Kimball walked through the darkness, unmindful of the possibility of pitfalls or unseen projections of rock. The splash of light grew larger, taking the form of a half circle. The golden glow seemed to suffuse her soul. And in the peaceful emanation it bore, Kimba could almost forget what the sow had done to her and what she in return had done to their leader. She reached the half circle that led into another chamber of the cavern. With a broad smile on her dark face, Kimba entered the chamber to meet Sundiata. The glow illuminating the chamber had no discernible source, but that mystery was not Kimba's major concern. Disbelief replaced the joy that had lit her features as she stared at the figure that sat on a raised di dais of granite. It was a man, a tall man of spare physique and serene countenance. His body was draped in a single length of unembroidered cloth, embroidered cloth. He wore no ornaments. Across his lap, a long tapering staff rested in a long fingered hands. Despite the simplicity of his garb, the figure exuded an impression of peace and power harmoniously combined, for all that it was a figure carved from the same stone as Dias. Only a statue, nothing more, Kimba thought numbly. Still, she spoke the name of the god-man the sculpture represented. Sundiata, she whispered through dry lips. Sundiata. Without conscious volition, her feet carried her across the empty space between herself and the sculpture. Reaching it, she dropped to her knees in hopeless supplication. She leaned against the sculpted feet. Stone toes butted against her face. Kimbia began to weep. In a bitter flood, tears cascaded down her dark cheeks, splashing onto the stone feet of Sundiata. It seemed she would stay there forever until she heard harsh noises behind her. Kiamba dragged herself to her feet to face the intruders. They were scouts from the South Army, five wiry men in light leather harnesses. Close-fitting helmets framed their scowling black faces. Swords sprouted from their clenched fists. Kotoko bitch, spat the foremost Sal. Did you truly believe you could escape us by leading a trail a child could follow? That doesn't matter now, though. We're going to make you pay for the death you gave Akeno. The sow advanced. The expressions on their faces were as flat and as deadly as the blades of their swords. Kimba stood in hopeless resignation. The dream that had sustained her throughout so much travail was as dead as the stone of the statue behind her. Head bowed, she awaited the bite of the blades into her flesh. Suddenly, the footsteps of the sow halted, halted and Kimba heard several sharply indrawn breaths. She looked up and saw that their faces had become masks of shock and amazement. Behind her, she heard a rustle of cloth against flesh. Turning slowly, Kimba gazed upon a sight that astonished her as much as it had the sow. Sundiata lived. Sundiata was standing. Gray, lifeless rock had become smooth black flesh and bright white cloth. On his dark, narrow face, an expression of terrible wrath was forming. A blue-white nimbus flickered around his staff as he lifted it high above his head. Then Sundiata stepped off the dais. The motion shattered the spell of disbelief that had initially stunned the sow. It's only a man with a piece of wood, one of the soldiers shouted. Let's kill him! 
Swords upraised, the five sow rushed towards Sundiata, who had calmly positioned himself between them and Kimba. He held the long staff tightly as a wand, unmindful of the blue and white lines crackling up and down its length. The sow formed a semicircle around Sundiata. Then their spokesman leaped forward and slashed viciously at Sundiata's throat. Sundiata's staff flicked upward to meet the sow's blade. As cold steel struck enchanted wood, a dazzling discharge concussed throughout the cave cavern. The attacker collapsed, dead before he struck the stone floor. Whiffs of smoke floated from the sow's charred corpse. Fear replaced the confident sneers of the faces of the remaining sow. This stranger was no easy victim after all. Powerful sorcery was evidently his to command. Almost as one, the sow whirled and rushed toward the chamber's exit and crashed and stumbled against each other as their haste as their haste to come to a halt when they saw the grim-faced Sundiata blocking their escape. Merciless marauders though they were, the sow stood frozen with dread as Sundiata raised his glowing staff. With both hands, the robed man held his staff, his weapon high above his head as his eyes blazed in merciless wrath. Before any of the sow could think to move, streams of spectral white incandescence shot from the staff. The stricken sow screamed in agony, then dropped each one a blackened husk that crumbled on impact with the floor. Kimba stared blankly at the litter of shattered corpse reduced to ash. Then she walked toward Sundiata. When she reached his side, she again fell to her knees and buried her face in the folds of his robe. You live, she murmured. Thank Niame, you live. Suddenly, Kimba felt herself being raised to her feet. Sundiata's touch was neither gentle nor forceful. It was impersonal as the pelting of rain during the wet season. Looking into his face, Kimba saw that the rage that had twisted his features was gone. His eyes now mirrored calm concern and reproach. Who are you and why have you awakened me? He demanded. Kimba could not reply. Remembering the fire that had struck down the sow, she shivered fear momentarily replacing the adoration she bore for Sundiata. Do not fear me, child, Sundiata said, as though he could read her thoughts. Your belief in me has awakened me from my slumber. I would not harm you, even though I prefer the peace from which you have summoned me. Yet I must know why you sought me, and why come to me bleeding and pursued by the sow. Kim lowered her head in shame, mindful of the clothing that the sow had torn from the upper part of her body and the blood that caked her thighs. Speak, child, Sundiata said urgently, urgently, gently, urge, urge gently, sorry. As the story of Kimbia, daughter of the Otunji, the drum maker unfolded, the emotions reflected in Sundiata's face ran from, ranged from pity to wrath. There was a war between Kimbia's kingdom of Kotoko and the neighboring Sal, homeland of the charred marauders. The struggle was as ancient as the founding of the two kingdoms, the advantage ebbing and flowing like the tides. In the current conflict, however, the Sal had acquired a champion, a being possessed of the strength of the mightiest warrior and the skill of the most adept sorcerer. Oshahar was the name of the champion who had led the armies of Sal into the gates of Kotoko. Oshahar, Sundiata erupted, surprised echoing his tone, echoing in his tone. Yes, Sundiata, your brother, Oshahar, Kimbia replied. But we know your brother could not be part of this evil. The one who led the sow must be a sorcerer or a demon who has stolen Oshahar's name. Perhaps, Sundiata said, shadows clouding his dark eyes. But you do not believe that, child, not truly. If you believe that Oshahar had departed along with me at the end of the second coming of the, Masa, of the Mashatan, you would never have come to this cavern. Indeed, of all the people of besieged Kotoko, only Kambia had believed in the songs of the griots, songs that hit that hit it cryptically of a cave hidden in the rocks, rocky full hit, foothills that led to the Guariti Malima Mountains. No one had paid much heed to Kambia's interpretation of the griot songs. She had seen the passing of only 16 rains and she had only recently undergone the Chikati rite for passage, which allowed her to wear her hair in the beaded braids of womanhood. Her father, Otunji, did not listen to her. Neither did her lover, whose name was 
Musakino. Both were preoccupied with the battle against the invaders. But Kiemba's belief in the legend of Sundiata was strong. Three nights passed. She had slipped from her father's house and out into the besieged city, confident that she could follow the griot's directions to the fabled cavern of Sundiata. But in the hills, she had fallen captive to a band of South scout troops. After discovering that she knew nothing of the military plans for Kotoko, the troops had raped her brutally and repeatedly. She had ended up with the scout's leader who insisted upon being both the first and the last man to have her. Sleep finally claimed the soldier, but not Kiemba, who slew the sow with his own dagger. Revolted by her deed, she dropped the weapon, but retained sufficient presence of mind to escape undetected from the encampment. The scouts had discovered the corpse of their leader and pursued Kimba to the cavern. At the conclusion of Kimba's tale, Sundiata stared impassively at the ashes of the sow. The staff of Nyankuma slew them too swiftly, he murmured. Time grows short, O Sundiata, Kimba said, urgency underlining her words. The sow have surrounded our city and Oshahar demands that we either surrender or face destruction. The emir, our king, defies him. But Oshahar will surely overwhelm us all, for neither sword nor spell can affect him. More and more of our people oppose the emir's stand against Oshahar. We must go to, Kiko to Kotoko at once, Sundiata declared. But we are three days' journey from the city, Kimbe exclaimed. Distance means nothing to the staff of Niamkuma. He said, come, grip the staff with both hands. Do not fear it. Kimba reached out and gripped the staff, her hands touching those of the God who was a man. A vibration tingled through her fingers and she could feel the outlines of strange, car of strange carvings pressing against her palm. Sundiata spoke words of a language Kimba couldn't understand. Then the cave disappeared. Under the best of circumstances, the sudden appearance of a strangely garbed man and a half-naked young woman in the middle of Kotoko would have disconcerted the inhabitants of the city. To materialize thusly at night in a city under siege would have been suicidal for anyone, save, save for Sundiata. Musukino, love of Kimbia, was the leader of the night watch. He stood within two feet of the spot where the two figures appeared, seemingly from nowhere. Musakino's first reaction was to assume that Kimbia and Sundiata were ghosts summoned by Oshahar. Swords drawn, Musakino and his fellow soldiers advanced on the intruders. Then Musakino recognized Kimba. Considering her tattered condition and the strangers of Sundiata, the words that came from Musakino's mouth were not surprising. Take your hands off her, you. This young soldier snarled as he reached to drag Kimbia away from the man he considered to be her captor. Neither his sentence nor his motion was completed. Sundiata touched Mushikino gently with the tip of his staff. The soldier fell as if though struck by a giant. He sat up, shaking his head in confusion. The rest of the night watch stopped short, weapons raised. Kiemba disengaged herself from Sundiata and rushed to the, to the side of Mushikino. She cradled his head with her arms and stared up at the other soldiers. Oh, you fools, she cried. Scorn lacing her words. Do you not recognize Sundiata, the god who was a man? The only one who could stand against a Shahar? And you dare to raise your weapons against him? There was a compelling glint in Kambia's eyes as she faced the armored soldiers. Then the stresses of the past few days overwhelmed her, and she slid into a state of exhausted semi-consciousness. Sundiata spoke for the first time then, his voice quiet, yet carrying an undertone of authority. It is true, he said. I am Sundiata. Because Kimbia, Kimbia believed in me, I live again. I must speak to your Amir at once. Please take me to him and see that Kimbia is treated well. She has endured much for the sake of Kotoko. Incredul incredulity was written deeply in the faces of the soldiers. Yet as they gazed at the faintly glowing staff of Nyankuma, they were compelled to believe that this was indeed Sundiata, who had passed into myth before the grandparents of their grandparents were born. They hastened to carry out Sundiata's wishes. Thus, Sundiata was escorted to the gold-spired palace of the Emir, while Mushunkino himself carried Kimbia to the house of her father. 
while the god who was a man conferred with the bemused Amir, Kiamba thrashed and moaned in distress on a sweat-soaked bed. Otunji and Mushokino kept vigil at her side, along with her mother, Sahia. The herb woman they had summoned had long since completed her ministrations, yet Kimbia continued to cry out in delirium. When she spoke of her rape by the South Scouts, it took the combined efforts of, Ot of Otunji and Sahia to, f to prevent Mushinkino from rushing out to confront Oshahar's army single-handedly. Later, when Kimbia spoke of Sundiata, Mushinkino did depart the house with the drum maker. For when Kimbia blurted disjointed words about how Sundiata had come to life, tongue to life, and wreaked havoc among the sow, her trembling and tears ceased. A smile spread across her face, and she spoke in a way Mushinkino had always thought was meant only for him, not Sundiata. Mushinkino walked Kotoko's street like a man bearing a difficult burden. If Kimbia truly loved Sundiata, how could he, Mushinkino, compete with a god? And worse, how could he hate his own savior? In the bright glare of the morning sun, the South Army was a formidable sight. Rank after rank of horsemen sat on magnificent mounts, lances glittering like rows of steel fangs. Cotton cloth and chain mail draped horse and rider alike. Foot soldiers were positioned in front of the horsemen. Usually they were a sullen lot composed of men unable to afford horses and mail. The South foot troops, however, were well accountered with swords, javelins, and large hide shields. Though their numbers were impressive enough, it was the, face of the faces of the South that inspired dread of those who sought to oppose them. Their faces were an expressionless as mass carved from jet. Only their eyes showed life. They were the eyes of madmen, men who would never cease fighting until they were cut to pieces. These were the soldiers of Oshahar. Oshahar stood at the head of, the, of his forces. Seven feet from the ground he towered, his thews mighty as a buffalo's. The sun glistened dully on his soot-dark skin. His only garments were a horned helmet made from the bone and a lion girdle fashioned from human skin. In his hands, the giant carried a staff much like Sundiata's, only much, like, much larger. This was Oshahar, the invincible, the destroyer. Like a deity of death, he stood at the van of his mad-eyed army, waiting for the men of Kotoko to come forth to meet their doom. As if in protest, huge iron hinges groaned until the gates of Kotoko gaped fully ajar. But no horde of desperate defenders issued from the opening. Only one man strode out to meet the sour host. Only Sundiata. Gaunt, robed, his staff resembling a walking stick more than a weapon, Sundiata appeared more scholar than warrior. He wore no armor and bore no blade. Yet for all his non-military demeanor, he was cloaked in quiet power and dignity. The Sao did not react to the appearance of Sundiata, nor to the open gates of Kotoko. Only Oshahar, Oshahar moved. As Sundiata approached, Oshahar marched to meet him. A few feet apart, the contrasting figures halted, facing each other in a symbolic tableau of good and evil. To the Sao, the confrontation of gods who were men were meaningless for Oshahar magic had stolen their wits. To the people of Kotoko, it seemed that a titanic struggle was about to begin, an unleashing of imaginable eldritch power. Yet Sundiata and Oshahar remained motionless, staring into each other's eyes. This was no battle. It was a meeting of brothers whose link was inconceivable to those who shared only blood kinship. Oshahar. Sundiata said, his voice echoing inside his brother's mind. Why do you do the work of the Mashatan? Why do you corrupt and destroy the people we died to save so long ago? From the recesses of the tortured soul that seethed beneath the bone mass, Oshahar replied in a tone laden with torment. Not my will, Sundiata. I was awakened by blood. A sorcerer of Sal, ruthless, ambitious, discovered my cavern, cut my cut his hand, bled onto my stone body, awakened me. I killed him. 
he screamed betrayal as I tore him to pieces and clothed myself in his skin and made myself what he wanted me to be. He did not know what blood does to us. I have turned the men of Sal into killers. I am cursed, must kill, must kill. Sundiata wept openly as he heard the agony of his brother's voice. He himself had been awakened by blood rather than Kimbia's tears, might have stood in Oshahar's place at the head of an army of men turned into beasts. As Sundiata wept, he knew that beneath the bone mask of his helmet, Oshahar's face also ran wet with tears, tears the color of blood. You are not cursed, my brother, Sundiata comforted, his voice penetrating the whirlpool of blood lust in Oshahar's mind. Your torment can end. There is only one way to return to peace. We must take that way, Oshahar, even though it means we must die again. I know what the way is, Oshahar, said Oshahar. The giant raised his staff. Then he swung it in a murderous arc aimed at Sundiata's head. Sundiata raised his staff to meet the blow. When the staffs clashed, the impact was accompanied by a report as loud as thunder and the blinding flash of blue-white fire. Within the walls of Kotoko, the people covered their ears and turned their faces away from the blast, as Sundiata had warned them to do. But on what would have been a battlefield, the South soldiers stared directly into the conflagration that seared deeply into their eyes. Abruptly, the blue-white luminescence face vanished. The space between Sundiata and Oshahar had stood was empty. The sow blinked their lids over eyes that now reflected sanity and blindness. The emirs of Kotoko rode out into the open gateway, followed by a mass of mounted soldiers. Amid the horrified cries of the blinded sow, the men of Kotoko rode, keeping their weapons seethed. What have we done? What have we done? We cannot see. The sow cried. Amir looked at his men. Sundiata had cautioned him that the Kotoko might still seek to slay the sow despite their sightless condition. For the sow had devastated the villages and farms surrounding the city and slain many people. And Kimbia had not been the only woman they had raped. But there was only pity for the Kotoko soldiers' eyes as they watched the sow stumble and grope and weep. Men of sow, the Amir cried his voice carrying above the babble. You are outside the city of Kotoko. You have been led to war against us by one who stole your wits and replaced them with madness. The, deaths of the, the death of the one who led you has stricken you with blindness. Great wrong has been done here, wrong that will never be righted. But we will return you to Sal, and we will protect you until your children grow strong enough to provide for you. By Sundiata, we swear to do you no harm. The sow heard, but their confusion and fear remained overwhelming. The soldiers of Kotoko were like herdsmen, gathering the blinded army and retrieving the sow's forgotten weapons. The plain outside Kotoko echoed the sound of thousands of shuffling feet as the sow departed for their homeland. As the sun sank in the clouds of orange, there was no celebration in Kotoko for their bloodless victory. The city was somber and quiet as the people awaited the return of the soldiers who had escorted the Sal to the boundary of the land. Others would continue into Sal to help the blinded soldiers adjust, their, adjust to their condition. Rusakino was one of those who returned from escort duty. He rode immediately to the house of Otunji. He wished only to see Kimba. He was certain he could reclaim her love, for Sundiata was forever lost to her now. He dismounted and entered the house with the drum maker. He found Otunji and his wife sitting disconsolately between beside Kimba's empty bed. Where is Kimbia? The soldier demanded. She is gone, her father replied sadly. Gone? Gone where? She has gone to Sundiata, Sahia said. Rushikino turned and rushed out of the house of lost love and shattered dreams. He leaped on his horse and thundered out of the city. 
He followed the route Kiamba had said she did, she had taken to the cavern of Sundiata. He was certain that he he was certain that was where he would find her. Although he was riding and she was undoubtedly on foot, Mushun Kingdom did not catch up with her during the days and nights of hard riding. Little heed did he pay to the people he passed who were beginning to rebuild their ruined homes and lives. Finally, on a moon-washed night, Mushun Kino reached the narrow hill trail that led to the cavern. Abandoning his spent mount, the soldier climbed the steep rocky path. He saw the red splotches that marked Kimbia's earlier passage along the trail, and he cursed the ghost of the sow rapist. When he entered the gold-lit chamber of the cavern, Mushun Kino guessed what he might see. Still, he entered. Two figures rested on the stone dais. Even the gray stone of their substance could not disguise the tenderness in their carved eyes. Slowly, Mushin Kino trudged to the dais. He leaned his head against the shaft of the spear he carried. Then he began to weep. His tears ran down the shaft of his spear. The wet trail almost touched the stone heel of Kimba's foot. Then it rolled down to the cavern floor. And that was the return of Sundiata by Charles R. Saunders. Um, I hope you enjoyed my reading. <laughs> and again, thank you guys for um, participating in uh, the celebration of Sword and Soul Month. If you miss, missed any of the videos, you can find them on my uh, website, my YouTube station, MV Media. Um, and also this reading will be there um, later on as I set it up. Um, hope you guys had a chance to, uh, like I said, take advantage of the sale we've been having this month. If not, it's still going on right now. It won't be over till midnight tonight. So um, you can pick up New and Body Tales as well as some of the other Sword and Soul titles that we have. And again, you guys take care. Thank you for your patience and support and Sword and Soul forever. <laughs>